313L student. You finished your plasma DNA preps. Now it's time to take your DNA to be sequenced. I will be taking your samples across the atrium to the ISU DNA sequencing facility. Here you will get a tour from Gary Polking and details of the sequencing process. Thanks, Claudia. I'd like to welcome all the biology students to the DNA facility. Recently, you've been studying the Sanger chain termination method of DNA sequencing in class. As you know, we can divide the process up into two major components, setting up the sequencing reaction in a manner similar to setting up a PCR reaction, and then making sense of the products of the reaction through the use of electrophoresis. Let's quickly review the components of a sequencing reaction. To do DNA sequence, we need the following things. First of all, we need template DNA. The template DNA is a DNA sample that you want to determine the sequence of. Most of the templates we sequence here are inserts that have been cloned into plasmids or PCR products. Secondly, we need a primer. A primer is a short piece of single-stranded DNA, usually about 16 to 25 bases long. We also need the deoxy NTPs, those are the regular bases, and we need the terminators, the dye deoxy NTPs. And as you can see, each terminator has a different color dye attached. We need a DNA polymerase to catalyze the reaction, and of course we need a suitable buffer. Remember that the ratio of the DNTPs to terminators has been optimized so that by probability every base position will be present in the final sequence. Once the reaction components are all added, the tubes are placed in the thermal cycler. The cycling process takes about three hours. Once the cycling is finished, the reaction products are cleaned up to remove the leftover dye terminators. They are now ready for electrophoresis on the DNA sequencer. As you know, DNA fragments can be separated by size by electrophoresis them on a gel. Larger fragments can be adequately separated with agarose gels but separation of fragments smaller than 100 base pairs would require a denser matrix such as polycrylamide, similar to that used to separate proteins. Because the products of the chain termination method differ in size by only one base, slab gel DNA sequencers use large polycrylamide gels. Until about 10 to 15 years ago, all DNA sequencing was done on slab gel based sequencers like this. This is the Applied Biosystems 377 DNA sequencer. When new, it cost about 110,000, and at one time the facility had three of these. Much of the human genome was completed using these instruments. The polycrylamide gels were poured between two optical quality glass plates using a 0.2 millimeter spacer. They were very thin gels. Once the gel polymerized, it was mounted in the sequencer and the upper and lower buffer chambers were attached. A heat plate was placed over the front of the glass plates to keep the gel at a uniform, optimal, and reproducible temperature for electrophoresis. Just like the agarose and page gels you have done in class, once the charge is applied, the negatively charged DNA fragments will migrate towards the positive, the red, electrode, being separated by size as they migrate. Eventually, the fragments will migrate past the read window which you see here. This small black object is a laser. It will scan back and forth across the read window as the gel is running. The light from the laser will strike the dyes attached to the terminator molecules, they'll fluoresce, and the signals will be picked up by a CCD camera that is behind here. The really nice thing about the fluorescent technology is that the software does all the rest automatically. It generates a gel image showing the individual bands in a lane, determines the intensity of each dideoxynucleotide incorporation and represents those as peaks in a display called an electropharogram that shows the base calls for each position, thus providing the sequence for the entire fragment. So this was very good technology, but it did have its drawbacks. These include, well, first of all, it was very labor intensive. You had to pour a gel, clean up the gel, load 80 to 96 samples, four hours later break down the gel and then repeat the whole process over. Secondly, errors in loading the gel were very possible, causing misassignment 
mixing, or loss of samples. You might recall what it was like the first time you loaded an Agarose or Page gel. These gels were much harder to load and there were many more samples. Finally, the software that identified lanes and assigned them to specific samples could be confused if there were gel artifacts including gel extrusion, excess salt in the samples, or buffer leakage. The lane tracking software could also be confused by a section of failed reactions with no signal followed by an area of samples with strong signals as we see here. If the software assigns the first sample with strong signal to, for example, lane 7 instead of 8, it would mean that every sample after that point is misidentified. To address and overcome these problems, new instrumentation was developed in which DNA fragments could be separated by size using a special polymer in a capillary tubing instead of a polyacrylamide gel. This is the facility's Applied Biosystems 3730XL DNA Analyzer. It was purchased in 2004 as a 48 capillary model for 250000 then upgraded two years later to its present 96 capillary configuration for an additional $100,000. This is a very well designed instrument and is still the state of the art instrument for fluorescent Sanger sequencing. Let's take a look at it. It works in a manner analogous to slab gel sequencers. Instead of a gel, samples are electrophoresed through a special polymer inside an array of 96 capillary tubes. Each sample has its own capillary. The polymer comes in a small bottle from the company and is easily attached to the instrument. It is automatically pumped into the capillaries and new polymer is pumped in for each new sequencing run. The buffer is supplied from a small bottle that we see right here. The samples to be sequenced are consolidated in a 96 well plate for loading. The rubber septum keeps the samples from evaporating during the time they are on the sequencer. The 96 well plates are then placed in the plate stacker for automated robotic loading into the sequencer. Up to 16 plates can be loaded into the plate stacker and about 1200 sequencing reactions can be processed by the 3730XL in a 24 hour period. Once the plate is in the correct position in the sequencer, the pins on the capillary array pierce the septum on the plate. A charge is applied and a small amount of the DNA sample is pulled up electrokinetically into each capillary and electrophoresis begins. Here we can see the inside of the oven where the capillary array is mounted. The oven keeps the array at an optimal temperature for electrophoresis. The samples will continue to electrophoresis to the capillary being separated by size as they proceed. Eventually the samples reach the detection window. Here the light from the laser excites the dyes attached to the terminator molecules They'll fluoresce, the signals are picked up by a CCD camera, and the software does the rest, just like with the 377 slab gel sequencer. The results of the sequencing run are evaluated by staff, and if of good quality, the data are posted on the facility's server. For each reaction, clients are supplied with two electronic files, one that can be used to generate the electropharogram image that I've shown previously, and one that contains the text, the AGCT sequence only, that can be used for purposes such as performing blast sequences or sequence alignment. To summarize the advantages that capillary sequencers provide over gel-based sequencers, first of all, labor-intensive tasks of pouring, loading, and cleanup of the gel apparatus are replaced by automated loading of capillaries with polymer and automated loading of the samples. Secondly, automated sample loading eliminates misloading of gels and using a separate capillary for each sample prevents accidental mixing of samples. Finally, having a separate capillary for each sample eliminates the problems of misassignment of lanes due to the presence of multiple bad reactions. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a very well designed instrument. In addition to requiring much less labor to run, its sensitivity helps make it very cost efficient to operate. The sequencing chemistry comes as a pre-mixed solution that contains the DNTPs, the terminators with dyes attached, and a version of TAC polymerase that has been especially developed for use in sequencing. Here's how the sequencing chemistry is supplied. This is a 5,000 reaction kit. In applied biosystems parlance, that means that with these two tubes, you could do 5,000 reactions using 8 microliters per reaction. As sequencing instrumentation became more sensitive, we were able to get good signals with less premix. At 4 microliters per action, the 377 could get 10,000 reactions from one kit. 
With the 3730, we can get a very good signal with just one microliter or even a half a microliter. But why is this so important? Each one of these tubes costs $16,000. You can get a decent compact car for that price. You can get a really nice car for the price of the entire kit. Being able to use less premix and much less labor means that we can charge our users much less per sample than we used to. 15 to 20 years ago, we charged our on-campus users $28 per action. Now we charge $6 and even less for samples submitted in 96 well format. Being able to pay a much lower rate per sample means that researchers can do many more samples for a given amount of money and thus can do larger sized projects. So now you should be familiar with the biochemistry of the sequencing reaction and how the sequencer is able to take the products of that reaction and produce the data you receive. If you were submitting samples to our facility, you would place the order online indicating the concentration of your DNA samples and the primer you wanted to use for each reaction. You would then bring your samples to our facility and we would do the rest. In most cases, for samples that we receive by mid-afternoon, data will be ready to download from our server by the following day. Finally, if you want to visit our facility in person, please stop by. We're just across the atrium from your classroom and I will be happy to show you around. Thank you.